In Jesus I am safe evermore. Praise the Lord. All right, open your Bible to Romans chapter number 12. Romans 12, we're looking at verse 8, part B. We're going to do, we're going to unwrap the gift of giver. The gift of the giver tonight. Romans chapter 12. Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word, Romans 12. We'll just jump right to verse number 8. Well, the Bible says, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, and then it follows, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Father, help me to be clear, sufficiently clear, Lord, so every heart will, will just get a sense of a grasp, of the basic idea of what it is to have the gift of giving and Lord, how to identify that gift in others when it's, when it's in action. And how, Lord, to uh, make room in the body of Christ for the giver. And for the givers to make room in the body of Christ for those of, of other motivation gifts. I pray, Father, you'll help us with this. Help your church minister to your body here. And I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. All right. Well, get back to work here on unwrapping the gifts. Or how many of you feel like you've got a pretty good idea of what your spiritual motivation is already? Does anybody have some idea? Does anybody have a general idea? Does anybody have something they might call a guess? Okay, we got, we got a few hands moving around out there. Okay, good. <clears throat> well, that's good. Well, I did warn you to not be premature. Wait till you've heard all of it before you settle on it. But you should be thinking about each one. And at least some of us should begin to start saying, yeah, you know, I think it's this or I think it's that and so on. But just be open for the Holy Spirit to have the final word, the final veto, as it were, and to communicate to you by his spirit, to guide you by his spirit to the truth regarding your spiritual motivation. So we're looking at the gift of the giver. This is lesson number six in this series, Unwrapping the Gift of Giver. We are covering uh, pages 45 to 47 in your course textbook, and that's in chapter seven. The worksheets we're using tonight are worksheets numbers 23 and 24, and they are found on pages 78 and 79 of your work text, the scripture we've read, Romans 12, verse 8, part B. Tonight, we're going to unwrap the gift of giver, and we'll proceed as we have with each of the gifts, there's a little bit of variation in the outline, but not much. An introduction in which we will try to help you understand the value of the gift and its role in the overall program of God. What is the gift of giving? We'll look at what it is by first trying to communicate some information that help you understand the role of giving through an understanding of how the word is used and then some basic Bible truth concerning giving. What does the Bible say about the act of giving and how does that uh, work into an understanding or proper understanding of the gift of the giver? And then characteristics that are common to the giver and then misunderstanding of the giver and then finally guidelines to be effective in the expression of this gift. Let's get started. The giver. I hope the picture doesn't cause you to get the idea that the givers are always women. Just figured along the way we ought to put some women in this thing too, you know, because they're also part of the body of Christ. Amen. So, all right. The giver. Here we go. Many have compiled lists of the attributes of God. He is sovereign. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He is faithful. And the list goes on. By sovereignty, we mean that he has absolute right to rule over all of his creation. By the fact that he is omnipotent, we mean he has all the power that there is. There is no limit with regard to his strength. There's no limit with regard to his knowledge. And that comes up in the word omniscient. And then omnipresent means everywhere at the same time, there's no place beyond his presence or outside of his presence. And then he's faithful. You know, he's unchangeable. I am God, I change not, he said in Malachi. And these are wonderful truths. These lists have great significance in some contexts especially. But I like to break it down to a real simple twofold statement that encompasses everything. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 6 that the foundation of faith is belief in this basic truth that God is and that he is good. All right. 
he is good. It really comes down to that. When we wonder where he is, or we wonder if he's good, our faith is getting wobbly. At the very foundation of faith is this great truth. God is, and he is good. And the truth that he is speaks to his self-existence and eternity. And the truth that he is good speaks to his nature and his character. The Bible says so much about our wonderful God. All the is's. In a book I wrote on pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, I went through a, an extensive study of all of the is verses. What I mean by that are those verses that tell us something about what God is. He is love. He is light. And there are several others. And they're all very good. But probably the one characteristic about God that is most apparent and the one that is most emphasized in the Bible is this, that God is generous. He is generous. Now, you might expect me to say that God is holy. Well, that is, without any question, emphasized. And I don't have time to go into it right now, as I might like, but God's holiness really is His goodness radiating, as it were, from Him throughout all of His creation. <clears throat> the word good, you know, we, we think of it in terms of being nice. But the word good also speaks to a quality of being. Goodness, as opposed to, well, badness. Or the Bible contrast is goodness as opposed to evil. So when we say God is good, we're including in that the, the fact that he is holy, but we're also including in that the idea that he's generous, that he's giving. And one of the most fundamental truths about God is that God is a giver. God is a giver. He gives and gives and gives. His very existence is a constant giving out of himself throughout all of his creation constantly. The thing God's most busy with is giving. So God is a giver. Anyone acquainted with God would expect then that it, among the gifts he would provide for his church, he would include the gift of giving. Remember, take a moment now to remember. As a matter of fact, what we're doing here when we talk about these spiritual gifts, we're talking about the manifestation of Christ. The first principle in our study of spiritual gifts is this truth that all spiritual gifts are a manifestation of the Spirit. And when we talk about these motivations, we're talking about the sevenfold or perfect motivation of our Savior. And He, we are baptized by the Spirit into Him, so we are in Christ, members of His body. As the Bible says, flesh of His flesh and bone of His bone. So we're connected to Him in such a, an amazing way, and yet we're individuals. And he manifests his sevenfold perfections, his sevenfold perfection in the manifestation of his motivation through separate individuals. So you're assigned to manifest this of him and I'm assigned to manifest that and somebody else is manifesting something else. And so we have these seven motivations that are actually uh, putting Jesus Christ on display in the body of Christ. That's what it is. Keep that in mind. So let's look at this one now. What is the gift of giving? The Spirit-given capacity and desire to serve God by giving of his or her material resources far beyond the tithe to further the work of God. The person who meets the financial need of his fellow Christians in church ministries. That was put together by Larry Gilbert. And I, I do that very rarely, as you know. But I do it on purpose in this case. This guy is really good on this subject. He has a lot of good information on the subject. So if you come across one of his books, you probably won't get hurt too bad if you read it, so long as you grab your King James Bible. I don't know why these guys can't find a Bible. I feel like writing them saying, I'd be glad to give you one. Yeah, it would be good to you. But anyway, I don't want to get into that right now. We're doing that on Sunday nights. <laughs> but that, that's one of, the, uh, one of the drawbacks with that, with that character. Understanding the role giver okay let's try to understand the role by first 
remembering again, and I'm emphasizing this, and I do it from time to time, I'll stop and remind you of this basic truth. Spiritual gifts manifest Christ in his body through the church. And then when the church is active in the community and the spirit of Christ is manifesting in that body, he is manifested to the community. So we keep that in mind. Now let's look at the word. We want to explore the role of giver by seeking to understand the words that are used. And then we'll look at some essential Bible truths concerning this gift. Defining the words used for giver, let's look at them. First, the Greek word, koinonietjeto. It sounds a little Russian, doesn't it? I'm playing around. That's not the correct pronunciation at all. But uh, it's koinonia. How many of you have heard that word koinonia? For a while there, it was a real popular thing to talk about koinonia. And it means fellowship and all that. It's from Strong number uh, 2841, and you would not be able to sleep at night without that information. So the point here, however, is that this word we're looking at is koinonia, koinieto, the various conjugations. But this word is used in the Bible to speak of giving. And that's interesting because at its root, the word has to do with connecting oneself to another in fellowship. And that's a very big part of the motivation of giving. Keep that in mind when you're thinking about God as a giver. God gives as a way of making a connection with you. He gave his only begotten son who died upon the cross of Calvary to make the most profound connection with you. When we give, we're making a connection between ourselves and the persons to whom we give. So that's important. That's an important part of the motivation. Uh, it's translated communicate in Galatians 6, verse 6. It's also translated distribute and partake, which is interesting. And it's, this, it's also translated contribute or contribution. Let's look at a couple of scriptures. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. In Galatians 6, verse 6, we're exhorted then to communicate to those who teach us. And our church is really good about that. And I thank God for our, our church and the faithfulness of our people to communicate to the needs of those who teach and preach and lead the church, Pastor Sanchez and myself. But that word communicate is the idea, uh, is used to speak of the concept of, of transferring from me, let's say, something of my physical possessions to you to meet a need. That's communicating. We think of the word communicating as kind of like what I'm doing right now, communicating. We think of it as verbally uh, expressing or exchanging uh, ideas or concepts or whatever conversation. But to communicate means more than that. However, go back to the idea of communicate as you might normally understand it and recognize in it this idea too that you are imparting to someone else something of yourself to them. That's what you're doing when you communicate, aren't you? Right now, I'm imparting from me the uh, benefit of my study in this matter. I'm communicating, I'm imparting that to you, see. So communication is an impartation of something of substance and value from one person to another person. And it includes also physical things. See also, but to do good and to communicate, here's that word again, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. This is important because it tells us that when we communicate, we're, we're giving something that God looks at as a sacrifice, an offering. He looks at it, he takes it personal when we give to one another. He is personally involved, he's interested in it. That's interesting to me. And it takes me to that passage in Luke 21 where Jesus is watching them as they filed by and gave to the treasury. And he's interested in this. He's watching this activity of imparting uh, something from one to another and so on. So to the rich, God gives this instruction that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute or to distribute, willing to communicate. And again, that doesn't mean willing to talk. It doesn't mean willing to get on Facebook. It doesn't mean willing to jump on Twitter. I understand Instagram is a big thing right now. I, better, I can't keep up with this stuff. So now we have to have an Instagram account. How many of these accounts are we going to have to have before we finally get so connected, you know, uh, <laughs> 
I guess that's not very funny to you. But anyway, communicate is the way this word is, is translated. This word koinonia, this idea of fellowship, this idea of connection. It's translated also distributing. It's tr- translated that way in Romans 12, 13. And partaker in 1 Timothy 5, 22, 1 Peter 5, 1, and 2 John verse 11. Let's look at distributing. Distributing to the, nece- oops, I jumped ahead. Distributing to the necessity of the saints. The one problem we have with keynote is you can't backstep one. If I backstep, I go back to the very beginning of the whole series. I don't like to do that. So So distribute. Now, obviously, that means as we're imparting or taking something of value and substance and handing it over or delivering it to another to meet some need, it it also includes the idea of a distribution among many. There's a one-to-one, and then there's a one-to-many. And right now, I'm doing a one-to-many, right? I'm communicating, delivering a, a, a substance of value, information, and knowledge, and understanding, and insight, and the Word of God on a certain important topic, and I'm delivering that or distributing that to all of you. So it's the idea of distribution. The Bible says, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of, another men, of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Now, what does that verse have to do with anything? Well, the word partaker. Partaker. This is interesting because we're drawing out of that word koinonia that has the basic idea of connection and fellowship, in reciprocated fellowship, okay? And so pulling out of that word and bringing out all these different ideas, you have the idea of communicating, you have the idea of of distributing, and now you have the idea of partaking. So not only is the giver delivering over something of substance and value to another to meet a need, they are also partaking in that. They're making a connection between themselves and the person to whom they're giving. I think it's very important to understand. That's why I'm emphasizing it's important to understand that when you're dealing with somebody who has this gift. One of the things I'm, one of my objectives in this series is, of course, to communicate enough information that the Spirit of God can use to enlighten you and help you come to a place where you go, oh, I get it. That's my gift. That's really what we're trying to achieve. However, I also want to achieve an awareness of these motivations so you notice them and recognize them in others around you. You see, that's very important because people have these different gifts, these different motivations, and sometimes we misunderstand what's going on and and we get into that when we talk about the misunderstandings, but keep in mind that even if I'm talking about a gift where it's really early on, you're going, "Ah, not me, that's okay. Tune in and listen very carefully Because you'll need to know how to identify this gift in others and how to understand them when you do. Can I get an amen? All right. (laughs) Okay. Partaker, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a, here it is, partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Partaker, for he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. And all of this is to show the concept of this word, koinonia, that is translated in contexts where it has to do with giving. We should bring the word partaker in here. We should bring the word distribute, distribution in here. And we should bring the word communication in here. And all of these words should help us get a rounded idea and understanding of what giving is all about, which speaks to the motivation of the giver. The Greek word is translated contribution in Romans 15 verse 26. So when you make a contribution to the church or to a ministry, you're doing this, you're communicating, delivering over something of substance and value to meet a need. You are, in doing that, becoming a partaker with them and, a, and being, becoming a con, a connected with them. That's why we're, we're careful about who we give to, what churches we support or what ministries we support. We're careful about that because we become partakers with them when we connect ourselves to them through our giving. And, uh, and then this, this business of, of, uh, of distribution, you know, sending out, sending out what will be 
something that'll help the kingdom or advance the kingdom or advance the cause of Christ. It's an exciting thing. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. So we're making a contribution. It means to share, to fellowship, to participate. When you see those big letters in all caps, it means it's time to start writing things down in your notes. If you are using those notes, because you're the kind of person that likes to write things in notes, it helps you learn and it helps you pay attention and all that kind of stuff. And for those of you who, it's a distraction more than a help. It, it gets in the way of you hearing and listening. Well, we provide the teacher set for you, so the blanks are already filled in. See how nice we are? <laughs> we got you covered either way. Also, it's helpful because if I happen to get going a little fast and I move too quickly and you don't get a blank filled in, you can go, ah, no problem. I've got the teacher's notes at home, so we're good. To share, to fellowship, to participate. Those are the three key words that help us understand this idea of giving. And that helps us understand the motivation of the giver. Now let's look at some Bible truth regarding the giver or regarding giving. Every believer is called to give. Hebrews 13, verse number 16, the Bible says, But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Well, this is a general exhortation to all believers we are all exhorted to do good and communicate don't forget to communicate that doesn't mean again don't forget to talk to your wife when you get home from work although that could be a nice gift to give your wife don't forget to you know talk your to your uh, your fellow employees at, at your job blah 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 no you i've already made clear what it means we are instructed to give as we have received Okay? You know, it, uh, it, it is a proper foundation for giving to reason this way. Well, I've been blessed. God has given to me. Others have given to me. Others have contributed to my life. It's only appropriate that I should reciprocate by giving to others. You see what I mean? That's a proper place for that reasoning to, to stand under the whole motivation of giving. You're not... Uh, I went to school, some teachers invested in me, I felt a responsibility when I was asked to teach at Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College to go and do likewise, right? So, you know what I mean? It's, it's appropriate to give as I've received. And so, keep that in mind, Matthew 10, verse number 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give. Amen. Giving is attended with spiritual blessings. You know, a lot of times we, we get focused a little too much on the physical blessings that come with giving. And they, they are there. It's important to know that. It's true. God does. In fact, it's the only activity uh, that we find in the Scripture where God promises material blessing as a response. It's the only one. He doesn't, he doesn't promise you a material reward for soul winning. He doesn't even promise you a material reward for reading your Bible or praying. But he promises you a material reward when you give. That's interesting. I guess it makes sense if you think about it, because when you give, you're, you're imparting physical things to meet needs. And so, you know, God responds to that by giving you the things that you need and perhaps even more. But for a moment, let's think about the fact that the ultimate blessing of giving is the spiritual blessings that come with it. Matthew 6, 4, Malachi 3, 10. The Bible says that thine alms may be in secret and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Now, when we did a series on the Sermon on the Mount, I spent some time with that language. We can't go into it as deeply as we did then. But let me remind you of a couple of things I brought out. One of them is this. That this verse, where it says that God sees in secret and rewards you openly, when you get into it and get into the context of it, the idea is that God shows himself with you in the open. In other words, you're missing it if you think all that he's saying there is that he, he does some nice thing for you in front of everybody else. Actually, what's going on here is he identifies with you publicly. 
And that can go a lot of different directions. It can go in physical blessings, but it can also just go in all kinds of different ways. Uh, for example, um, when Jesus pleased the Father, you heard a voice from heaven say, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Father was stepping out and publicly acknowledging, This is my Son. And in a public way, God will do that for us if He sees us doing in secret things that please Him. He will openly show Himself and His favor upon us. So don't limit it only to physical blessing. It can just be in any number of ways that God shows his favor publicly for you. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now, herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now once again, we have a tendency to think of that in terms of physical blessings. I think it can include physical blessing. Because God's favor in your life can manifest in oh, any number of ways. But the idea is heavenly blessings. The Father's going to open the doors of heaven. The last time I checked, I've never found dollar bills raining out of the sky. Okay? The heavenly blessings can result in prosperity, of course. But you get the point here. It's the connection that's made between you and heaven that's in view here. In these verses, the connection that's made between you and the Father, the connection that's made between you and heaven. Giving does not begin until after the tithe. Okay? The tithe is a principle that's articulated in the scriptures before the law. You remember, the patriarch Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Tithing. And it's, you know, they, they have this law of first mention. We'll get into that in our hermeneutic series when we finally get there. The law of first mention. So the first time you hear about the tithe is a case where you have God's man communicating, giving a tithe to God's priest and God's king, the king priest of Salem, Melchizedek, who was the priest of the most high God. So that's what tithing has always been about. And when you come into the law, then later on, when God articulates the commands of the law, he establishes tithing as the way the priesthood, his priesthood, would be supported. Later, when Jesus comes along uh, and basically is addressing the question, how shall the gospel be supported, the gospel ministry, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Jesus said it's supposed to be done the same way it was done during the time of the law. The same way, the same method, same principle. So we don't, we're not teaching that right now, so I'm not going to go into it and break it all down and work us through all, all of that. But the tithe has always been to make sure there's food in the house of the Lord or provision for his house. His house in the, in the New Testament is the church, and our tithes are given in order to supply or to make uh, provision for the church ministry to be appropriately supplied that it might carry on its business and its work amen the point i want to get around to here is when we talk about giving we're talking about beyond the tithe that giving doesn't really start until we get past the tithe not that your tithe isn't giving it is we call the receipt we give you at the end of each year uh, usually by the end of the year Har har. That was supposed to be funny, but it's not funny. And I apologize for that. We're trying to fix that problem. And we're really, really close to being able to get this so it's not the headache it has been for the last couple of years. So <laughs> getting back to this, we call that your giving receipt. It's an acknowledgement of what you have given into the ministry of the Lighthouse Baptist Church. So it's giving. But to differentiate here, what we're trying to say is that there's the tithe, which is something that we're all obliged to do. And we give, we're all obliged to give to help whatever and so on. But there are those who are motivated to have a ministry of giving. That's their motivation. They're moved that way. They're organized that way. They think that way. And that's their ministry. And so that's where the difference comes in. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. So we honor the Lord with the first fruits. I'm often asked by new believers, hey, I've been here about the tithing thing. I think I'd like to do that. I believe the Lord wants me to do that. Uh, how does that work? Do I, uh, do I, how do I, how do I tithe the first fruits? You know, do, when, do I pay my tithe on the gross or on the net? 
And uh, we, this, this verse establishes the principle that God comes first. So we tithe on the gross. And some say, yeah, it's pretty gross. But anyway, you know, that joke just continues to work. I don't know how it does it, but it just always, it always gets at least a chuckle. But in any event, yeah, we, we tithe on the gross. Of course, we put him first. Giving by, you say, well, but they took it before I even got it. I know. And what are you going to do about that? Tithe on the gross. That, that. Giving by faith is giving according to what we have and not according to what we have not. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 12. We emphasize that during our missions conference and anything else, anytime else we're trying to raise some money for this. We emphasize the fact that faith giving is not blind, emotional, you know, do something like this and go, and a number pops in your head and so on. It's, it, take, pay attention to what you have. You look at what you have and you assess what part of what you have you can legitimately give and let go of and put into the ministry. The Bible teaches that. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 12. We give according to what we have and not according to what we do not have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath. Now listen to this next phrase. And not according to that he hath not. I emphasize that because it's possible some of you come from a background where faith promise giving was presented in a way where you were encouraged to, I don't know, it's almost mystical, kind of come up with a number in a spiritual, emotional kind of way or whatever, and then just believe God for it. You know, I, I heard one guy say, don't tithe on what you make, tithe on what you want to make. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that. Those are clever ways to manipulate people into giving, perhaps. I think it has worked for some ministries. I despise it. I think it's wicked. I think it's evil. The Bible specifically says that people should give according to what they have. The Bible specifically says they should not give according to what they don't have. So it's, it's a complete contradiction to that whole, that whole way of thinking. Uh, God doesn't bless. Uh, you know, look, God is, I can't get it. I, I, I want to go there now. I'm not going to. I'm going to stay with these notes. That's one thing that's helpful, but it's helps to get done on time. <sighs> okay. All right. Giving is determined by the individual's ability and desire. The individual's ability and desire. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, this for God loveth a cheerful giver is this preposition for tells us this idea is coming out of a certain premise. If you follow what I'm trying to say here, is here's how you can make sure you protect your joy in giving. Don't let somebody else talk, to you, talk you into how much you're supposed to give. Giving is accompanied by the promise of material wealth. Given, it shall be given unto you, pressed down, a good measure, excuse me, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, God is the controller of this principle. And not all men are obedient to him. But God finds a way to finally get it to you, right? Uh, there, there have been times when, you know, a certain person should have been the one, according, according to what's uh, clear from Scripture, but that person did. Here's what I'm trying, here's what I'm thinking of. I had a certain pastor friend that was complaining about his church not supporting him, and thank God I don't have that complaint. Praise the Lord. But he was complaining about that. And, uh, and I said to him, I said, you, you know what? You need to not worry about that. If the church is not doing what it's supposed to do, that's between the church and Christ. Don't make it an issue between you and them. Make a big mistake. You, you depend on Christ, not them. See, now, God did ordain that they'd be the ones that would take care of you. But if they don't, Somebody else will. God knows how to find a raven that can get a mouthful of bread. 
and figure out where you are. Amen. So it's important to understand that principle on your side, too. There are times when certain persons ought to do certain things and you're waiting for them to do it and they're not. Well, they're just maybe they're not being they're not being obedient to the Lord. Don't worry about it. Amen. The Lord is the one who operates these principles. OK. Having said that, moving along, giving is considered a spiritual sacrifice. It is an offering to God. Hebrews 13, 16. Wow. That's pretty neat. That means every time you participate in this business of giving, you're actually giving something to God. You're presenting an offering to Him. But to do good and communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. That verse comes up over and over again in our study. Giving should only be done with cheer. God loveth a cheerful giver. And I mentioned how to avoid losing your cheer, keep this principle in view. You don't give as I have purposed for you to give. You understand? In other words, it's, it, we, we have a need for the church. We're going to get a bus or whatever, whatever we're going to do. And so I decide, here's how much we need, and I assign to each of you how much you're going to give. Excuse me? That doesn't work that way at all. You give as you purpose in your heart. You don't give as I purpose for you. Or as anybody else purposes for you, for that matter. You give as you purpose in your own heart. And you just commune with the Lord about it. And uh, you give. Let me tell you something. If you think God has told you to give something and it makes you mad. That probably didn't come from God. If it did, don't give it till it makes you glad. There's something about this cheerful giving thing that people have really misunderstood. I've heard preachers get up and say, give till it hurts. And no, you give till you rejoice. You give until it makes you glad. Until you feel a certain liberty and enjoyment in it. It is possible to give too little and be grumpy. Give a little more and get happy. That's true. But that's for you to figure out. You know, if, if a certain amount comes in and I go, no, nah, they're, they're, not, they're not giving enough to be happy yet. <laughs> Believe me when I tell you, I never think those sorts of thoughts. I don't. I, just, I, I think it, when it comes to that stuff, I'm busy thinking about what I'm going to do, <laughs> what Becky and I are going to do. We're praying that way together. What are we going to do? We're not thinking about what the rest of the church is supposed to do or going to do. And so... Amen. And, and thank God I have liberty in that. And I've always had that, by the way. It's just not something I came to. It's just been that way right from the very beginning of my ministry. It's just that I know this goes on because I talk to other pastors and some of them are really, really miserable. Because they're too worried about what somebody else is doing. That's not the way to be. All right, characteristics of the giver. What are characteristics of the giver? Now we're going to try to help you kind of figure out whether or not you're one of these Fellas or fillas, fillas, whatever the word is. <laughs> Let's get on with it. <laughs> All right. The giver is characterized by the ability to make wise purchases and investments. About half of you say, well, not me. <laughs> but the giver has a knack for this. They have a kind of instinctive knack for making wise purchases and investments. Okay. The giver prefers to give quietly to effective projects or ministries. In parentheses, I have the usually the giver is careful to avoid the pressure of publicity. The giver doesn't like being manipulated to give. Amen. Well, none of us really likes that. Okay. But there are, you know, there are some people who, who do respond to that kind of stuff. All right. I, I understand. And I don't want to I, anyway, I've been in I, I, I've been ministry for a long time and I sometimes I think I've seen it all. And as soon as I say that, something else shows up. So I'm not going to say I've seen it all, but I've seen a lot. And I've seen atmospheres created in churches where the giving is almost carnival like. Um, I, I saw a, a one church where they had these strings that went out over the congregation with clothespins on them. And as the string came by, you're supposed to reach up and put a twenty dollar bill in there. And they were rolling the money in. That, first of all, just seems like a whole lot of work. That does not seem like a practical way to gather an offering. That seems really, but it was fun. People were laughing. I get, I don't know. It's just, to me, giving is worship. And I don't, you know, a carnival atmosphere in, in worship just somehow doesn't work for me. 
Uh, I've seen all kinds of weird stuff. Never mind. I'm not going to go any. We don't need to go any further. I just see a lot of really strange ways of collecting an offering. And I'm like, what is that about? People seem to be enjoying it, though. Not me. I don't think I have the gift of giving. I don't have some. I have other gifts that probably interfere with my ability to enjoy that kind of thing. But I, to me, it, just, it grieves my spirit. I think giving should be something that happens uh, as an act of worship. As an act of worship. Something that you're mindful that God is watching while you do it. And you're doing it with him in view. It's okay. The giver is alert to valid needs that he fears or she fears others might overlook. We don't have gender confusion here. I got a woman up here with a purse open. I keep saying he. So I want to clear it. And I'm just kidding around. (laughs) The giver enjoys meeting needs without the pressure of appeals. He goes kind of said that already a couple of times. The giver takes special pleasure in giving when his gift is an answer to specific prayers. <clears throat> Who was that? Somebody, some pastor, sent me a check for $25. It was Save. And I happen to know that Save, that was actually kind of a thing for him to do. I mean, it wasn't going to break him. But, you know, it was, it was, anyway, that was significant. And so when I got it and I saw who it was, I thought, wow. What was so weird about it is it was that very day I had a deficit of $25. Or I needed 25 for something. What was it? It was something like that. Huh? It was a trip I had to go on, and I needed exactly $25 for this. Oh, I remember now. This is awesome. I, I took a, a speaking engagement, and, I, you know, I, I, it, it, I'll tell you what, it would be really easy to bury Mrs. Scheidbach and I in these things if I'm not careful. So I, I have to be, I would take every meeting, and I'd walk if I had to. Okay, but I got a family. Okay, so... I promise her, this one is not going to, because this, this, this situation wasn't one where I was going to be given a very, uh, an offering that would cover my expenses, okay? That happens sometimes. It's okay. I don't care. <laughs> but we didn't have the money, and I told Becky, I promise you, this won't cost us anything. Remember, I, saw, I told her that. And then I realized, oh, oh, it's going to cost me 25 bucks. Now, some of you are worried about me right now. You're thinking, you can't handle a $25. I don't want to try to explain this to you, okay? Do I have to? Thank you. Because I'm not going to, even if you want me to. But so so when that check came in, I thought, that is so neat. The father timed that so perfectly. So I showed Becky. So that that encouraged her faith to believe, oh, okay, this was the Lord. And I was able to tell somebody, this was the Lord. And Savi got all excited. He was thrilled because it was the Lord. All right, the Lord touched his heart. He did it. One of those things. Givers like that kind of thing when they can see, oh, oh, it was the Lord. The giver usually depends on his or her partner's counsel to confirm the amount of a gift. I believe that's good advice anyway for all of you who are married especially. The giver is concerned that the gift be of high quality. The giver desires to feel connected that he or she is a part of the work or person to whom the gift is given. And I mentioned that earlier and emphasized that. That's a big part of the motivation of giving. It's a connection that's made. I would encourage the giver to recognize the very first and most important connection is the connection he or she has with God. That's the big one. And make sure you keep the other connections you're looking for in your giving second to that. Don't let that get ahead of the more important one. Now, misunderstandings of the giver. The need to deal with large sums of money sometimes appears to be a focus on temporal values. The desire to increase the effectiveness of a ministry by his gift might appear to it to be an attempt to control the work or the person. I counsel pastors a lot, and there are times when I've, the Lord used me to help a pastor or two avoid making this mistake. You know, the fact that a person gives and is interested in 
the effectiveness of that gift doesn't mean they're trying to take control of the ministry. It means that they're smart. <laughs> okay? They want to know that what they're giving is actually productive of, of the good that they're hoping to encourage with their gift. Amen? The attempt to encourage others to give might appear as a lack of generosity. Now, sometimes givers hold back from giving when they notice others aren't. You know, and they'll do that. Again, because they don't want to feel like, you know, it's all on them. The, the fact is, often givers are blessed by the Lord with something to give. Okay? So, being that they are often blessed with something to give, and they've been giving, and so God has publicly favored them and identified himself with them in this or that way and so on, and there's some enjoyment of the benefits and the blessings that come with giving, sometimes they look like the rich guy on the block. Let him do it. Now, I'm going to say something that's very important. Anytime a church gets like that, they are sick. Seriously sick. And a giver who's in tune with the Holy Ghost would be right to say, uh-uh, I'm out of that. Amen? Just because somebody has a lot of money doesn't mean they're the ones that's supposed to pay for everything. In fact, what could kill a church sometimes is somebody with a lot of money who's only too willing to do that and let everybody else renege on their responsibilities. We each one need to do our part, whatever part that is. It can be a little, it can be a lot. You've heard me say it many times. If every member of our church does what the Bible teaches that they should do with regard to their personal finances and giving, this church will have what it needs to do what God wants us to do. Amen? It will. If each member does what they're supposed to do. And that means the member whose tithe is $10. That member holding back that tithe, spiritually, because remember, this is a spiritual thing that can interfere with God's blessing upon, upon the church. So we want to, each one of us do what we individually are tasked to do by the Holy Ghost. The lack of response to pressure appeals can also seem to be a lack of interest or a lack of generosity. And so sometimes givers come under pressure like that. What's the matter with him? Why doesn't he do it? Why doesn't she do it? She's got little money bags over there. Why doesn't she take care of it? See? So somebody's sitting in the church and the church is trying to raise money and the church is looking at so-and-so and thinking, well, why don't they, they can just write a check and be done with it. That would be the worst thing that could happen. Each person should participate. Amen? Everybody participates. The personal frugality by which the giver often lives might appear to friends and relatives as selfishness and not wanting to meet their, well, wants, really, and not their needs. That's not usually the issue. I have to hurry now. Effective expression of giver. How to effectively express this gift. Understand how you're misunderstood. Avoid the things that trigger those responses. Learn to submit to the authority of your church leaders. Hebrews 13, 17. You know, each of these gifts have a whole stack of negative things if the person who has that gift is in the flesh and not filled with the Holy Ghost. In other words, this caution I've made about, about uh, we should not interpret somebody's who has a giving gift who wants to invest in a ministry as trying to take control of it we shouldn't it would be a mistake on the other hand if givers get in the flesh that's exactly what they'll do <laughs> so and then the prophet and I'm, we're going to go into that later on i'll talk about how dangerous it is to express your gift when you get in the flesh channel your ministry into and or through your local church i think that's very important I wish I had more time to develop those points. Maybe we'll get back to them later. But it is important. Do not despise the day of small things. You know, givers like to be part of big things. And, uh, and that's understandable. So it's important for the giver to be careful not to measure something only by its apparent size. You have to measure it by other things, other criteria, including that, but by other criteria, see. So don't despise the day of small things. And then also, the, uh, the giver will, will need to avoid the temptation to use their gifts to purchase influence, as I already mentioned. 
Keep it simple. By the way, that isn't a typical motivation of a giver. Just as it's true that a server isn't motivated to take over your life and all this. We get into all that later on. But if you get in the flesh, the devil can get in there and make a mess of things. Keep it simple. Do not complicate the gift with strings attached or by concocting complicated schemes. Um, that's interesting. The Bible says that we're to be simple in our giving. Now, the way I, the insight I took from that word is appropriate and I think worthy of our acceptance. But the truth is the word simple there actually means to do it with sincerity, not duplicity. To be generous and sincere in their giving. But sometimes uh, they do, uh, givers will come up with some ways to get everybody giving and to do things that just, it's almost bewildering. Um, of course, that can also just be a, a Scheidbach personality thing. I tend to complicate things. <laughs> the newest guy around here is going, yeah, I know. I'm like, Wait a minute, if he thinks that. But anyway, scoring. If you answered yes to from 85 to 100% of the characteristics and misunderstandings, well, then you are a likely candidate for the gift of giver. Amen. So there you have it. Next time, the gift of ruler. Everybody wants to be the ruler. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll talk about the gift of ruler. Actually, the truth is, we have, uh, it's interesting, everybody wants to be the gift they aren't. Have you ever noticed? It's just so weird, but it's true. And I think there's something spiritual about that. I think it's a way the Lord has of saying, you prefer others above yourself. But most people, whatever gift they have, they admire some other one. The prophet typically admires the mercy shower. The mercy shower usually admires the prophet. All right, and so on. A lot of people want to be the giver because givers are usually rich. So everybody wants to be the giver. Uh, they're not always rich. That's, a, that's kind of a misnomer. But often they are. So... Be careful about that kind of stuff, amen? Be happy to get to show Jesus to somebody. Whatever of Jesus he wants to show others through you, be glad and rejoice. Let's stand together in the presence of the king. So next we'll unwrap the gift of ruler, otherwise called the gift of administration, because Americans chafe at words like ruler. We don't like rulers. See? And there's a good history for that, by the way. But we'll get into that when we talk about the ruler. We'll do that next time. Right now, I want to ask you an important question. What do you suppose that question is that I want to ask you? If you died today, where, are you 100% certain you'd go to heaven if you died right now? All right. If you have any reservations and answer that question, please, let's talk to you before you go home. All right? And by let's, I mean me. Or somebody, if you're a woman, we'll have one of our ladies talk to you. If you're a man, I'll talk to you probably or one of our other guys. But we'll, we'll open the Bible and show you how you can know you have eternal life. Not think you might get it, but know that you have it. Let's sing as we conclude our service this evening.